actual lecture stuff. And this is where I lose my voice. All right, so. Oh yeah, here you go. Let me turn on annotate. All right, so what are viruses? So first things first, the word virus actually means poison. And so I'm sure you guys all know what a virus is. It infects people, animals, plants. It's basically poison because it's like sucking the life out of something else. They're all harmful. Yes. So, and poison, that's what it means. So the more like actual definition of what a virus is, is that they are small infectious particles with genes packed in a protein coat. So do you think viruses are alive? Would you say viruses are alive? Yes, okay. We have one vote for yes. And there's no right or wrong because like this is something that's really heavily debated in, uh, um, in biology. So there's no right or wrong whether you think they are alive or not. Okay, so Alan says yes. Okay, so there's been a lot of debate about whether they're not they're alive or not in the definition. They're particles. They're not. Notice how they're not. This is supposed to be like not organism because again we don't know if they're alive or not. Well, we do know if they're. We do know how they work. We just haven't classified them yet because there's been a lot of debate. So they can spread disease just like bacteria, but the only thing that's kind of stopping it from becoming life is that they need a host to reproduce. They can't reproduce by themselves. And that's why uh, people are not considering them life because being able to reproduce by yourself is a characteristic of life. So like, um humans you are the child of your parents because your parents produced you plants they have seeds they give rise to new plants these are all characteristics of reproduction that we find in life but viruses they need something to allow them to reproduce so we we call them sort of a borrowed life so they're kind of life but they're also kind of just chemicals now I will say that I personally think that they should be considered alive because in my head, all organisms have this purpose. So the purpose of evolution and all of that jazz is to pass down your genes. And I think a purpose of a virus is also to pass down it, its genes. So it has like this, it can evolve, it can adapt, like it's, pretty much life so yeah and there are also fun guy that can't reproduce by themselves but we call those life so yeah that's my stance uh yeah interesting connection it is in a state of superposition which just means that it can be found in like two places at the same time um so viruses are much smaller than bacteria they're much simpler again they're just genes and coded in proteins. Um, experiments with virus have led to advancements in our understanding of how DNA replicates, how DNA translates into RNA, and RNA translates into protein, which are transcription and translation. Um, the composition of our genes, our genetic material, what determines various traits. Uh, also, gene transfer and biotechnology and gene therapy, which is essentially using genetics to like cure conditions. Viruses have been helpful in that. And it was discovered, well, discovered by Adolf Mayer in 1883. And he didn't like discover it. He just, well, I guess he technically encountered it, but he didn't know it was a virus. So he technically didn't discover viruses. He just discovered this thing that was later found to be a virus. And so at that time, there was a tobacco mosaic disease that was taking the tobacco industry by storm. And the, the, um, the leaves of the tobacco were all 
um, becoming, they all had these brown spots, as you can see at the top here. So we found that this disease could be spread by rubbing the sap of the plant with the disease to a healthy one. So if you just rub it together, this thing transmits to the other leaf. And so that spreads the disease. And so at that time, he was like, oh, this has to be a bacteria because like it's spreading, it's infecting new life. But when he tried to put the leaf substances through a filter, he couldn't find anything. There was no bacteria that was strained and left behind. So he was like, oh, well, this is going to be an invisible bacteria. Oh, we did science full times today. And during life science, the only time I used stage for the... Yo, okay. So proud. Did you make the team? Don't know. Yeah, the reason why I teach this is to get better myself for science full. So, good job, Alan. Everyone join science full. In fact, for next week, we're going to be doing a science full round. Oh, okay. I see. So, you are a life earth science specialist. Okay. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, so a decade later, this other scientist, Dmitry Ivano Ivanovsky, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Um, he tried to filter it out again, but he could not. Um, Martinus Bejerinik, Bejerinik, I don't know, maybe, hey, yeah. But uh, he actually showed that that agent in the sap could replicate, but it could not be cultivated on dishes or test tubes. So if you guys have ever seen a Petri dish, it's just like a round dish. And then there can be like, purple spots or like pink spots on it, or just like, you can cultivate bacteria on Petri dishes, but he couldn't do that. So he decided it couldn't have been bacteria. It had to be something else that was even smaller. And that's where we get viruses from. Um, and then this was confirmed in Wendell, by Wendell Stanley's 1935 experience, experiments where he named the tobacco mosaic virus. So, um, the discovery of viruses is technically attributed to Beijing. Yeah. But these are all like the chain of events that led up to it. So interesting. Okay, so actual virus structure. Um, so the uh, main thing to remember is that viruses are like smaller than basically all things that we recognize as life. They are 20 nanometers in diameter, and that's smaller than a ribosome, which is a part of another cell. Um, it's really small. You can't see it with uh, your naked eye. And even under an, a light microscope, only the biggest viruses are visible. So a light microscope is like it enlarges stuff, but not that much compared to like an electron microscope? Yeah. Um, so unlike life, their genomes can have a lot of different kinds of nucleic acids. So our genome is mostly double-stranded DNA. The genome of a cat is mostly double-stranded DNA. A plant genome is also mostly double-stranded DNA. But viruses can have genomes that are double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, and single-stranded RNA. So basically all of the nucleic acids they can make use out of. Um, so they are classified based on what kind of nucleic acid your genomes have. Oh, um, nucleic acid is just basically DNA and RNA. Those are nucleic acids. Uh, so their genetic material is organized into a single linear, which is like straight or a circular nucleic molecule or nucleic acid. And the smallest virus has only four genes and the largest one only has a few hundred. So compared to a bacterial genome, um, bacteria have around 200 to a few thousand genes on average. Um, compared to a human genome. I think we have like 
hundreds of thousands or maybe like hmm, 60,000 don't call me on that but we it's just that we have like a lot more um so it's enclosed so these genes are enclosed by something called a capsid and this capsid is a shell made out of proteins so there are many different shapes of capsids which essentially give viruses their ultimate shape. It can be rod-shaped polyhedral, so some sort of polygon or icosahedral. We'll see examples in the next slide. Um, the capsids are built from a large number of subunits sub that are called capsomeres. They're, even though they're built by a large number of them, um, capsomeres don't have a lot of different kinds of proteins, but there's a large quantity. Uh, so some shapes of viruses include helical viruses. Uh, they are rod shaped and they contain viruses like the tobacco mosaic virus, adenoviruses, also known as icosahedral viruses. They infect respiratory tracts of animals. And as you can see on the next slide, um, yeah, on the image to the right you have the tobacco mosaic virus which is rod shaped um it has dna for genetic material and then we have adenoviruses which are icosahedral which like they kind of look like a hexagon turned sideways they have dna and then probably the most um the most recognizable uh virus well I guess the most recognizable virus today is like the coronavirus, which is a virus with spike proteins that we'll talk about on the side, but also the bacteriophage T4. Yeah, let me go through the slide and then we'll look at that. So um, adding on to the genetic material and capsule, capsid or protein coat, um, you also have accessory organs, or not organs, sorry, structures on viruses that help in help them infect their hosts. So this would include a viral envelope, which is a membrane envelope that surrounds the capsid. And so these viral envelopes are also a part of the host cell um, and the virus. So they basically integrate and they help the virus combine more efficiently to the host itself. You have viral surface proteins, which bind to specific molecules in the host cell. Um, so the coronavirus, you have these spike proteins uh, attached to cells and attack our body system. This helps them attach more efficiently and spread their genes. Some, uh, some viruses may even contain enzymes, which is unique because they're really small. Enzymes help speed up chemical reactions. You have bacteriophages, which are also called just phages. These are viruses that infect bacteria, and they are the most complex because not only do they have like, the head, they also have a little body and small filaments. Uh, so... Okay, so there are many different bacteriophages. They are titled T1, T2, T3, T4, based on the order that they're discovered. They usually are made out of an icosahedral head with the protein tail with fibers attached to it. Um, as you can see on the far right, that is a bacteriophage, um, probably electro... Uh, electron microscope diagram. Yeah, pretty cool looking. It looks like a cooler spider that I would not want to encounter in my back. All right, so there's been a lot of research on the bacteriophages and their life cycle. There are two main life cycles that are determined. Hi, Caleb. Okay, so we're just Going through the slides right now, talking about viruses, we finished up on the structure, and now we're going to look at their how they reproduce. So they mostly replicate using two cycles. 
Uh, keep in mind that bacteriophages are double-stranded DNA viruses, so their genomes are made out of the same genetic material that ours are. So the first cycle that they use is called the Leydig cycle. And so ultimately, this cycle means that their host cell uh, dies. So I want to more clearly define what the host cell is. So viruses are technically not life because they can't reproduce on their own. So, but they can reproduce in the presence of a host cell. So basically, they attach to this host cell and then they spread their genes into the cell and then the cell actually reproduces the genes for them through some mechanism and the new viruses come and it's like the whole thing but yeah so that's what the host cell does so the lytic cycle is named after the last stage of infection and this includes the lysing of bacteria. So again, keep in mind, we are dealing with bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. So anytime you mention host, you can assume it's a bacteria. So lysing means breaking open. So essentially the bacteria breaks open and it releases all of the genes that the viruses had in the cell. And it also releases all the new viruses in the cell. So these viruses can go on to other cells and reproduce in those cells, and then that cell dies and they spread again and then again and again. Um, yeah, okay, so a bacteriophage that only replicates using the lytic cell is called a virulent phage. So we'll look at the other cycle too, but some bacteria some bacteriophages can use both, but those that can only use the lytic cycle, are, they're called virulent phages. I think it's virulent. I don't know. I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, yeah. So uh, if bacteria, sorry, if bacteriophages can just attach to their host cell and kill them, then why haven't phages wiped out all bacteria? Well, this is because, obviously, evolution. Evolution is basically just organisms adapting so that they can better survive. And natural selection is descent with modification. So that means each generation, you get a stronger pool of genes that favor survival more. And so natural selection actually favors receptors. I, there's a typo there. But natural selection actually favors receptors of bact receptors in bacteria that they just can't recognize. So how viruses actually attach to their hosts are that they use different receptors and they recognize things on the surface of their host cell and they attach to them. But if they can't recognize a potential host cell, they're not gonna attach. So that's how bacteria have dodged a bullet by adapting and evolving these new receptors that they just cannot recognize. But Oh, wait, no, not the but yet. We're not at the but yet. Also, uh, phage DNA is often recognized as foreign DNA. So because viruses need to attach to the host and inject their DNA so the host helps them reproduce it, then they are strongly dependent on the host actually accepting their DNA. But we have immune systems that recognize things that don't belong in our body. So the same is with bacteria. Bacteria recognize virus DNA as not a part of their body, and so they cut it up using restriction enzymes, which cut the genetic material, and it's not spread. But also, natural selection also favors mutant phages that can recognize new receptors. And so because we have like this evolutionary race between can this bacteria evolve so that it avoids viruses? And can this virus evolve so that it can find this bacteria? You have this ongoing relationship between the parasite and the host, and it sort of becomes an evolutionary race. Who can win? So when you have two organisms that are in this close of a relationship with each other, this is very common. So yeah, just... Recognize how organisms adapt to each other. So, but another reason why bacteria aren't killed off already is that is because they can 
survive due to a state called lysogeny, which brings us into our next uh, cycle. So this is a example of the lytic cycle in action. You see this attachment, you see the virus bringing in the gene material, you see more viruses, you see the cell break and the viruses release. So the lysogenic cycle is a way for bacteria to reproduce without killing it. And so bacteria who use both the lytic and the lysogenic cycle, they're called temperate phages. So these phages are represented by the Greek lambda, and they look like bacteriophages, like T4 in the previous slides, but they don't have one of the tail fibers. So the lysogenic cycle begins with a bacteriophage binding to the surface of the host. So something uh, I also want to emphasize is that bacteriophages are viruses that uh, infect bacteria. They're not bacteria, so I think I'm just going to say phage now so it's less confusing. But first, the phages inject their linear DNA into the surface of the host that they bind it to. So in the lytic cycle, this would immediately turn the host cell into this replication factory for their DNA. And then the cell would lie soon and all the viruses would get released. But then in the lysogenic cycle, the DNA is incorporated onto a specific site of the host chromosome. And chromosomes are where all of the genes are located. So this basically joins the viral and the host DNA together. And so when it is integrated into the bacterial genome, which is their host genome, the viral DNA is called prophage. So the DNA from the virus that is a part of the bacteria now is called the prophage. So over time, prophages are mostly silent because there is one prophage gene that basically suppresses all of the other traits. Uh, there are also other genes that can change the host appearance or phenotype. So when the host cell divides, then the prophage also divides and passes down its coffee. And so this copy and this creates a lot of prophages really fast. And it's really good for, I guess, long term spreading your genes. So the term. So the term lysogenic means that prophages can generate then active phages that lyse their host cells. So yeah, does anyone have any questions so far? I can also go slower. I'm just looking at how many slides we have left. Okay, I will probably move a little bit faster. Okay, so this is the lytic and the lysogenic cycle in action, as you can see. So looking at the text on the left, the viral genome's key, um, key feature is that it can have a lot of different nucleic acids for the genome. So it can have DNA or RNA. Uh, but few, okay, so few bacteriophages have an envelope or RNA for its genome. As you can see in the previous slides, we assumed all of the bacteriophages had double stranded DNA. Then animal viruses oftentimes have both an envelope and RNA for its material. And so uh, there are a lot of different classes of animal viruses. And so let us take a look. So probably uh, most notable include herpes virus. So they have the envelope and they cause herpes, also chicken pox. And yeah, pox virus causes smallpox, which fun fact, Smallpox is the only disease to be completely eradicated off of planet Earth. Uh, coronavirus, yeah, single-stranded RNA. This is why mRNA vaccines work, because 
their genome is also mRNA. So we can simulate this, we can simulate the coronavirus genome. Uh, and yeah, we can create a vaccine and condition our body to it. So I'm going to point you towards the bottom right, the retrovirus. They have double-stranded RNA, or sorry, single-stranded RNA for their genome. And they're really unique because the RNA is actually a template for DNA. So usually DNA is a template for RNA, which is a template for protein. But they actually go backwards. Uh, so they also have a nuclear envelope. And really important to remember, HIV is a kind of retrovirus. And AIDS is the actual condition. HIV is the actual virus. So viral envelope. So the envelope, we already looked at before, but it's used to enter the host cell. Basically, there are proteins on the envelope that can bind to receptors on the host cell. Um, not going to go through the replicative cycle. Um, okay, I'll go through the herpes virus one. So something unique about herpes virus is that they have they have membranes in their envelope that is derived from the nuclear envelope of the host. So the nuclear envelope is the thing that surrounds the nucleus, which has all the genetic material. Uh, yeah, then this membrane is shed into the cytoplasm. And as this happens, copies of viral DNA are left behind as many chromosomes in the nuclei of nerve cells. And so these copies of viral DNA do not actually produce viruses until they're triggered. Uh, but when they do, they leave blisters, which are the characteristic of herpes. So this is an example of how a virus would enter. So looking more closely at the viruses who have RNA as genetic material, most of them infect animals. So you're not going to find bacteriophages with RNA genomes. Some of them infect plants, but not that much. So there are three types of single-stranded RNA genomes. So those of class four serve as mRNA. And so this means that right after they get infected, they already have the template for proteins. They can translate RNA into proteins immediately and spread their genes. Um, oh yeah, okay, so the cycle on the previous slide was for class five where RNA is the template for mRNA and then this mRNA is uh, translated into protein. I'm trying to like flesh out all of the non-important stuff. Okay, so again, the most complicated replicative cycles of viruses belong to the retroviruses, which are class six. So again, there are three types of single-stranded RNA, class four, five, and six. Retroviruses are class six. And so they utilize an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So again, enzymes are catalysts of chemical reaction. That means they speed them up while lowering the need for energy to release them, to, um, for them to occur. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Um, so basically how a retrovirus infects a host cell is that HIV first enters the host cell and reverse transcriptase, the enzyme, is released into cytoplasm. And so the RNA translates, or the RNA turns into DNA. And this DNA is combined with host DNA, and it gets reproduced again and again. So integrated viral DNA is called the provirus. And unlike the prophage, the provirus never leaves the cell. It just keeps on replicating and then it's turned into proteins, but it never actually leaves. Uh, and then the host's 
for RNA polymerase because the virus doesn't have RNA polymerase. It turns the DNA into RNA and then it turns the RNA into protein. So we get these new proteins from viruses. Very cool. So uh, here is an example of a retrovirus, retro, retrovirus life cycle. You have, so this is an HIV molecule. You have the receptor proteins. You have um, the envelope, the capsid RNA. So it first attaches to the cell, releases all of its contents. You have the viral RNA. It goes through reverse transcriptase, turns into DNA. DNA goes into nucleus, forms for a virus, and then new proteins are formed. So yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. So viruses evolved, have evolved from a long line of things. Uh, so uh, it's mainly believed that viruses evolved after the first cells. And so their origin is said to be naked nucleic acid bits were moving from one cell to another when they got trapped inside proteins. And so the uh, main candidates for these nucleic acid bits are from things called plasmids or transposons. We went over plasmids next class. So plasmids are circular, small DNA molecules in bacteria. They exist outside of the genome and can replicate independently. So the bacterial genome isn't actually a plasmid. A plasmid is just like a free-flowing chromosome. Very cool. Um, transposons are jumping genes. We 55, I'd like to say 55% of our body, definitely a little bit over 50 the 55% uh, of our body's genes are made from transposons. And so they're basically segments of DNA that can like leave and insert themselves anywhere. So many people believe that when they were moving somewhere, they got, uh, they got integrated into these viruses. And so the key thing you need to remember between plasmids and transposons is that they're both mobile gene genetic element. So that means they can move. So in this process of moving, viruses were probably created. So some virus genomes are actually identical to those of the host, which is very just interesting. And they're more similar to their host than the other viruses. So although some viruses like animal viruses can be similar to plant viruses, which shows that they all evolve which is very important. So new insight, new research has been casted on this virus world through the study of the Mimi virus. And the Mimi virus is this, or I guess it's called Mimi, I don't know. Mimi virus is this, it's the largest virus ever found to date. It has double-stranded RNA, a cosahedral capsid, over 400 nanometers in diameter, which is different from our 20 nanometers in diameter, obviously. And it's named after uh, the words mimicking microbe, the first two letters. And so the microbe here is bacteria. It's basically like it mimics a bacteria. It has 1.2 million base pairs and 1,000 genes, which is very different from like a few hundred at most on average for viruses. It produces genes that are hallmarks of cellular genomes. So things that define cells, chemical reactions, they include translation, translating mRNA to protein, DNA repair, making sure our genes work correctly and the way that they're supposed to. And these are these hallmarks, trademarks of life, but viruses have them and they're not considered life. So this makes us think that maybe Viruses actually evolved before cells, and cells evolved from viruses because they both have this, these enzymes and genes. So last slide, finally. Um, so we're going to be talking about viroids and prions. So within this general group of viruses, we have smaller... A smaller scope of them, a smaller group called viroids, and they are viruses with circular RNA genomes, and they infect plants. 
So they their genes actually don't encode proteins. So if you guys don't know already, genes basically the point of genes is to make protein. And so proteins are essentially what fills our bodies, what create who we are, our hair, our fingernails, everything is made out of proteins. So they don't actually encode proteins, which is very rare for a genome. But instead, they replicate in their host plant cells using the enzymes or proteins of their host. So enzymes are also proteins. And so this causes errors in the host regulatory system. So viruses are actually the cause of the death of more than 10 million coconut palms in the Philippines in recent years. So the virus that caused that is called Kadang Kadang. Kadang Kadang, I don't know. It is very fun to say though. So you also have prions, which are infectious proteins. So this is really interesting because they're just proteins. They don't have genetics or genes. And this makes us really wonder, like, how can these infectious proteins actually like trans like uh transfer or infect other people and organisms. So prions cause, cause brain diseases in various animal species, for example, scrapie in sheep, uh, mad cow disease in cows. I cannot pronounce that in humans. Um, uh, the symptoms for prions usually take more than 10 years to develop, which means that they are actually virtually indestructible because they're like a protein. They're not like a bacteria where you can just not give it nutrients and it will die. A protein is not life. You cannot like, you can denature a protein, which is essentially breaking apart the structure, but you can't kill it, if that makes sense. So to this day, there are no cure for prion diseases. And so the question is, how can a protein that cannot replicate itself or provide anything for a host to replicate itself become a transmissible pathogen pathogen and so the proposal is that uh, a misfolded protein in a brain cell when it interacts with other proteins it somehow converts that protein into also misfolded and that's how it spreads but it's really 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 gray area in the sciences right now okay that was very extremely long 